So here's a story. This is a story of a boy who I saw in the emergency department, but I saw him with this um, history. He had been running out of the store, and he just saw a policeman. And he was just running out of the store. He, he was energetic. Um, he told me, and I think he told everyone else, he didn't do anything that made him, but he just basically came out of the store quickly. And then he saw the policeman, he made eye contact, and then he just ran. He doesn't know why he ran. The police obviously thought they needed to figure out why he was running and chased him, and they cuffed him pretty tightly. And that was what brought him to my attention in the emergency department. He was 15 years old. Those are usually the next door hospital, the hospital University of Pennsylvania sees kids that are older than that, um, you know, 18, 19 year old kids. So we saw the 15 year old, and we saw him for a forearm injury, and this was what I learned. Um, his backstory was that his father was killed by police when he was six. And he just didn't know why he ran, but I had a better idea, I think, than he did at that point. What, what was going through his head when he looked at a policeman who looked at him possibly with a, with a look that he perceived as, you better run. That was Dr. Joel Fine, professor of pediatrics and emergency medicine at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Hi, I'm Sarah Schweig of the Center for Court Innovation, and we're at the Minority Youth Violence Prevention Initiative Kickoff Summit in DeKalb County, Georgia. The Minority Youth Violence Prevention Initiative is a joint effort by the Office of Minority Health of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Office of Community-Oriented Policing, or the COPS Office, at the U.S. Department of Justice. This is the first meeting of the nine grantee sites of the Minority Youth Violence Prevention initiative. Participants are hearing from experts from both medical fields and policing fields about ways public health and police can work together to prevent violence. Let's hear the rest of this particular story before turning to the conversation I had with Dr. Fine directly following his presentation. I'm going to talk to you about what I call knowing is very different than screening. I'm not screening him for anything. I just want to know his story. And taking the time, his mom and grandma, who were not there with him yet, um, both had chronic illnesses. The grandmother's worse than the mom. They seem to have a pretty strict household. Um, and strict can be good or strict can be bad, depending on how strict. And what about the difference in authoritarian and authoritarian, authoritative parenting is where pediatricians put their um, line in the sand. Um, and then he has two younger sibs, and one of them is a challenged child uh, with autism. And he said he was doing okay in ninth grade, which is the appropriate grade for his age. He never got left back at that point, um, but he felt like his school was unsafe uh, and that he didn't enjoy being there. Uh, and he had a few friends that he called friends, but he didn't have anyone that he could tell anything about his life. So this is the kid that was in front of us, and this is not unlike a lot of kids where the environment is really tough, and they are doing the best they can to negotiate. So I'm here with Dr. Joel Fine, and he just gave a great presentation on the effects of trauma on the developing brain. So maybe first you could just talk about why doctors and hospitals are getting interested in preventing violence. What are some of the things that sort of spurred that on? Sure. Well, I think that uh, you know doctors and hospitals, our business is to uh, both make people healthier and prevent illness from occurring. And I think that the concept of wellness includes uh, both you know, mental health and physical health. Interestingly, what we now know about violence and the trauma that it causes in people's lives is that it affects both emotional and behavioral health and physical health. And it's become very squarely in our wheelhouse to think about how we can devise ways as a hospital system, as a medical system, to try and prevent and treat the impact of violence in our patients' lives. And one thing that you discussed was a study of people in their 50s and 60s of the outcomes of earlier trauma or stress. Could you talk a little bit about what that was and kind of how you're incorporating research into your efforts now. Sure. You're referring to the ACEs studies, right. which have been uh, fairly well known to associate adverse childhood experiences, which mm -hmm. is what ACEs means, to long-term health outcomes. And we're learning much more now about the mechanisms by which that may be occurring. 
As a pediatrician, I'm very interested in how uh, children develop and their brains develop. And we are starting to realize that the uh, brain has a, there's a great impact of these early childhood experiences on the way someone behaves, acts, and feels, probably because of the way that changes in the hormonal <coughs> systems and the brain structure and even the genetics of what's going on in their bodies and their families is happening. And you mentioned the relationship between, you know, the body makeup and uh, genetic predisposition to stress and its relation to the environment. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. It's really not a genetic predisposition to stress right. as much as a, um, a potential potentially different ways that the body expresses the genetics based on the environmental exposures that someone's had both prenatally and, and afterwards. So for example, you can have two exact same people with the same genes in a different environmental situation and those genes would be what we call coded differently to create different proteins that may create a different what we call phenotype or expression of those genes. What would you advise when dealing with these populations to keep in mind? Sure. I think the take-home message is that knowing about the impact of these experiences on how people act and react really helps us understand better how we can, first and foremost, not re-trigger and not have them re-experience trauma because we are in positions as physicians, policemen, even social services people of power. So we don't want to trigger them. And then taking it a step further, um, creating a system by which there's less threat and less stress so that we can interact with the human being that they want to be and we want them to be. Wonderful. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. I'm Sarah Schweig of the Center for Court Innovation, and I've been speaking with Dr. Joel Fine. We're at the Minority Youth Violence Prevention Summit for the Office of Minority Health and the COPS Office. To learn more about the Center for Court Innovation or this initiative, visit www.courtinnovation.org. Thanks for listening.